Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Even though our groundhog friend, Punxsutawney Phil, said there's still a few more weeks of winter left, we are ready for spring here at Coral Reef Alliance. Love is in the air and gametes are in the water. And we're here to talk about them spawning. My name is Zach Horton and I'm development director here at Coral. As many as many of you know, our mission is saving the world's coral reefs. We were founded in 1994 by a group of concerned divers. And for the last 26 years, we've been working with communities to reduce direct threats to reefs. In parallel, we are actively expanding the scientific understanding of how corals adapt to climate change and turning this science into action around the world. Learn more about our work at coral.org. And if you have any questions today, please enter them into the Q&A box below and we'll answer after our presentations. As we expand our science on a global scale, we are fortunate to work with numerous partners and incredible scientists around the world. One of those scientists is here with us today to get everyone in the Valentine's Day mood. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emma Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy is a coral reef research scientist specializing in climate change impacts on reef communities. She was originally trained as a zoologist and completed her PhD in Caribbean reef ecology at the University of Exeter in the UK. Over the past five years, she's led over 23 diving research expeditions from the Coral Triangle to the Caribbean. She just started a new position at the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, and she's had a lively start. Tropical cyclone Kimmy hit right as she was moving to Townsville. And then she got sent out last minute on a 10 day research expedition. She heads back into the field tomorrow. So thank you, Dr. T Kennedy, for taking the time to be with her, everybody here today. It's also my <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> It's also my pleasure to introduce Coral's own Dr. Helen Fox. Dr. Fox is a coral reef ecologist by training. She has more than 20 years of experience working at the boundary of science and conservation with geographic expertise in Indonesia and the Coral Triangle. Her work includes investigating links between marine protected area management and governance, ecological impacts and human well being. She currently serves as the Conservation Science Director at CORAL and is most recently known for her fun radio interview about this very same topic, Love on the Great Barrier Reef. Helen's been in the water during a mass spawning event, and it's a moment she won't ever forget. So please, get comfortable, pop some bubbly. I know it's the middle of the day, dim the lights, and enjoy this romantic presentation. Dr. Kennedy, I'll pass it on to you. I hope everybody can see that. Okay, let me see that back. Yep. Well, I am super excited today to share some Valentine's Day stories from the reef with you all. Um, and I did just wanna give everybody a quick heads up that I am a biologist and we are going to be talking about coral reef production and maybe SUX. So there's going to be a little bit of biology in here. And if you're feeling uncomfortable at any time, you can just put your hands over your ears. Um, all right, let's get going. Uh, so I'm a hopeless romantic and I love Valentine's Day, but even I have to admit that we don't generally associate sea creatures with romance, unless maybe you're thinking oysters. Um, and I don't know about you, but the thought of swallowing a raw mollusk who spent his life filter feeding nutrients isn't super romantic. Um, so often when it comes to thinking about romance, it involves a bit of snuggling. 
that mm. these creatures are really not very snuggly. They're often slimy, they can be tentacly, many have stingers, and generally they're not very attractive. But actually the huge diversity of animal phyla that we see on reefs means that there's a really interesting range of reproductive strategies out there. Valentine's Day also gets us thinking a lot about creating the right mood. Um, but in fact, the mood in the ocean is not very romantic. It presents a really challenging environment to marine reproduction. It's huge, it's moving around and finding each other can be really hard in the ocean. And Pixar, of course, made a whole film about that. So I don't need to tell you how hard it can be to find friends in the ocean. And locating your significant other uh, it's just one challenge. So many reef creatures are what we call sessile organisms, which means that they're anchored to the ground and that presents a whole other challenge. So if you thought that COVID restrictions made dating hard, it's particularly hard to date if you're literally glued to the ground and you can't move. The little barnacle suffers from this problem and it's come up with an ingenious strategy to deal with it. Uh, so most barnacles have to fertilize each other internally, so they're not like fish that can spawn into the water around them. And so to find a partner, uh, they have a super long penis that goes out exploring nearby to, uh, to find nearby barnacles to put their sperm into. And even Charles Darwin, whose birthday is coincidentally today, spent years studying barnacles and was incredibly impressed by the length of their penises. Um, the cool thing about barnacles as well is that they're hermaphrodites and so in theory every single individual can fertilize and be fertilized by all of its neighbors and if there's nobody else within reach they can fertilize themselves which is a very neat trick. Barnacles are of course crustaceans which means they're actually quite complex animals so as well as their penis they'll have little eyes and eight tiny feathery legs and coral in comparison are is very, very simple. So they're just two cell layers thick and they don't have any true organs. Essentially, they're just like a little mouth uh, surrounded by stinging tentacles and a stomach. And that's pretty much it. So they don't have eyelashes to flutter, beautiful feathers to strut around. They certainly don't have penises. They couldn't bring you a pebble and they couldn't snuggle. So you would be forgiven for thinking that their reproduction might be quite boring. But in fact, they've come up with some really ingenious ways to replicate. And some of them you might have heard of and some of them you might not have. So one of the cool things that corals do is that they reproduce asexually as well, which is actually quite unusual for marine invertebrates. Um, so corals like this big lettuce coral here are made up of lots and lots of tiny polyps joined together. And you can see all those little tiny mouths that I was talking about before. Um, and a close-up looks something like this. So budding is where a young polyp grows out from another adult polyp. So essentially they're dividing themselves into clones, which uh, is quite a perfect thing to be able to do on Valentine's Day, really, you can just clone yourself to keep yourself company. Fragmentation is another asexual reproductive strategy, and that's where the actual colony splits. Um, so it occurs, particularly in branching coral, perhaps in a storm, a branch will completely snap off and it will be able to settle somewhere and form a new colony. And so you can split into two. And there are actually some really complex strategies. They've got things like coral bailout, where a polyp just actually rolls off the side of the colony and drops off and begins a new colony. And parthenogenesis has been seen in one or two species, which is kind of like the virgin birth. It involves a coral growing embryos without any fertilization at all. There's some pretty confusing and complicated things corals can do. Um, but we're not here to talk about sexual, asexual reproduction. Sex is fun and um, sexual reproduction is actually incredibly important for maintaining a healthy genetic population. Uh, you don't want to end up really inbred if you're a coral. And it also allows corals to uh, spread into new areas and create and replenish far away reefs. And Helen's going to be talking about that in the next presentation. So almost all corals, and all corals reproduce sexually as well as asexually. Um, and of course, they're animals. So they reproduce using an egg and sperm, just like other animals, mixing these um, and eventually a fertilized egg 
will turn into a tiny swimming uh, coral planula, which will swim around in the ocean, anything between a few days to a month or so, and eventually find a place to settle out where it can then grow metamorphose into a new uh, polyp. So how did that egg and sperm find each other? Well, it's not quite as simple as boy coral meets girl coral. Like our little friend, the barnacle, most coral species are hermaphrodites, which means they can produce both sperm and eggs as well. About a third of corals, um, particularly some of the elk horn branching species, are gonochoric, and that means they're unisex essentially. So you'll have uh, male colonies that will produce only sperm and females that will produce only eggs. And there's no difference in the appearance of those colonies. You can only really tell when it comes to breeding time and producing those gametes would be able to look inside the cells and tell which were male and which were female. And that sex is genetically determined and it won't change through the animal's lifetime. Um, so whether you're a hermaphrodite coral or gonochoric, there's also different strategies for how and when these corals decide to breed. So coral larvae are essentially formed in two different ways. They can be uh, fertilized externally inside the coral or uh, externally outside the coral or internally. Um, so in brooding coral species, it's a little bit more like human reproduction in that the larvae are fertilized, that the eggs are fertilized inside the coral polyp. So a sperm enters, well, through the mouth, so not really like a human. Um, and you'll have a large egg in there, um, which will become fertilized by that sperm and the coral planula will develop inside. And when it's a good size, the polyp will spit it right back out into the ocean, where it'll eventually go off to become a new adult coral. And so brooders usually release like a few large larvae that will settle like pretty soon after their release. But there's another strategy that corals use called um, spawning. And in the spawning species, both the eggs and sperm are released into the ocean and there's external fertilization. Um, so a few of those will be fertilized by chance and hopefully develop into some coral larvae. And the moment at which the eggs and the, spawn and the sperm are released is called coral spawning and of course it needs to be timed quite carefully because you don't want to release your eggs one day and the sperm another day you need them all to meet. Um, so in some areas mass coral spawning events occur on a particular night of the year and this is what we call synchronous spawning and it's where multiple coral species will all spawn at the same time. It's something that was actually only discovered fairly recently in the 1980s in Australia, but we now know that it happens all over the planet and scientists are getting much better at predicting exactly when this will happen. So generally just once a year, sometimes twice a year, where all the corals on a reef will coordinate their spawning as a kind of strategy to increase the chance of those um, eggs and sperm meeting each other and becoming fertilized. And this is the bit where it does get a little bit romantic. So the synchronized spawning always happens um, after sunset and often it's um, linked to the time of the moon and other triggers, things like the number of daylight hours and seawater temperature and amount of food available as well. And as eggs and sperm get released on the mass spawning day, they're really buoyant. And so they all float up to the surface of the ocean. Um, it's been described as looking like an underwater backwards of snowstorm. And I saw in the poll some of you had been lucky enough to see a spawning event underwater. Uh, I never have, so I'm very jealous. And they form these um, giant pink oil slicks on the surface of the sea where the eggs and sperm will all meet. And most of those eggs and sperm will probably be eaten by hungry fish and zooplankton and other animals that come in to enjoy the spawning event and get some um, protein. But of those that do meet, eventually after a few days, a planula larva will be formed 
And we used to think that these lava just drifted randomly around in ocean currents. Um, but we now know that they actually have some pretty good swimming capabilities and sensory capabilities. And so this little lava that would probably be smaller than a millimeter um, will swim around in the plankton, um, depending on the species, for sometimes over 200 days. And eventually, um, if everything goes well, they'll fall back to the ocean floor and attach themselves to a hard surface. And the attached planula will eventually metamorphose into a coral polyp, and that polyp will begin to grow through asexual reproduction, through that budding that we saw dividing itself, again, making more genetic copies of itself until eventually an adult colony develops and the whole cycle begins again. Um, but we all know there's no such thing as a happy ending. Um, and today, corals are a little bit in crisis. So the reproductive success has been really diminished by things like stress. So it's always hard for animals to breed when they're under stress. Um, and especially as we're seeing corals dying and bleaching events, we're seeing um, some of those coral spawning events a little bit diminished. So in the end, a little bit of a, a little bit of a sad story. Um, but I, I hope that was a good overview and um, there's some good new long words you can press people with in there and get it in my slideshow now. And hand over to Dr. Fox. Uh, so that was fabulous, Emma. I am always impressed by what an excellent scientist, communicator, and off the charts PowerPoint whiz you are. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do now is explain why we at the Coral Reef Alliance care so much about coral spawning and its links to adaptation as a long-term evolutionary process. So we're going to veer away from the romance for a bit and talk about the big picture. Uh, and as Emma alluded towards the end, coral reefs are facing numerous threats, uh, none of which are romantic. Uh, so unfortunately, um, the big three threats are uh, overfishing, pollution, and climate change. And the first two of these are often uh, local threats, which can theoretically be addressed with community-based uh, programs or country-based policy solutions. And climate change, as we all know, is a big global threat. So our work at CORAL is based on science that indicates that coral reefs can adapt to the effects of climate change, like warming oceans, if they are healthy, and this in many cases means we need to protect them from the local threat. So we are trying to work on both of those. Uh, and uh, how do corals adapt? Spawning is key uh, because part of adaptation is having babies. And corals that are thriving in warmer temperatures right now likely already have heat tolerant traits as part of their genetic makeup. So we need them to spread those traits to other reefs so future generations of corals are better prepared for warming temperatures or other threats that they're facing with other genetic traits. And as you just heard from Emma, the way they do that is by making babies. So um, you got a great uh, overview. Oh, could we? are we doing next slide? Sorry, Zach. That was the threat slide, sorry. Uh, so that's all of the threats that we did. And then this is why spawning is key. And now, okay, great, we've caught up. Next slide, please. Um, as, as you heard from Emma, uh, corals release gametes. Uh, these are the sperm and egg bundles that break apart, float up to the surface, uh, mix and create coral larvae. They float in the water for days or even weeks or swim along, as uh, Emma said, before settling on the reef. So at the bottom of this picture, you see a, a swimming larvae. And on top of that, with the little septa, just like a little disc, uh, is a newly settled one polyp coral. Uh, so that's what they look like. And I also want to explain the cartoon of dispersal uh, next to it. So if you imagine each circle is a habitat patch or a coral reef, Sometimes the coral larvae settle on a new patch on the same reef, and those are the arrows that are 
pointing back to the same reef. Uh, this is called self-seeding. But if the larvae are in the water for a long time or get caught in currents, they can travel for many, many miles between different patches. And so those are the arrows going nearer or farther to different patches. Um, and as they're doing that, wherever they're going, they're bringing all of their genetic traits with them, carrying them from one reef to the next or different patches on the same reef. So next slide, please. So we'll now uh, throw in a little heat, uh, temperature wise anyway. Uh, so the red in this cartoon shows reefs that experience warmer waters, the blue shows cooler waters, and the yellow is the medium. Over the long term, when the corals that are already thriving in warmer areas send their gametes into the water, those gametes are bringing the heat tolerant traits with them and they're creating more heat tolerant baby corals. So over time, those little corals will grow up, they'll reproduce, the, they'll spread their uh, successful heat tolerant traits. And this will all be important because with global warming, the cool reefs now are going to heat up. So overall, our research showed that we want to be sure to protect a diversity of reef temperatures. Next slide, please. And it's not just a diversity of temperatures, it's a diversity of genes. Uh, for those of you watching with kids, you've seen probably firsthand how your kids are a mix of <laughs> two halves. Uh, for example, my older daughter has inherited my husband's love for doing puzzles, and she looks remarkably like my mother's high school portrait. Corals are similar. It's not just heat tolerant traits that can spread. Other genetic factors can spread as well. So the key for us is protecting a large diversity of corals to give them the highest chances of spreading the genes that will help them survive the coming changes. And we humans can't necessarily predict what those will be. There is disease also, you know, a lot of different things that uh, corals have to deal with. Uh, and luckily, nature and evolutionary processes have been designed to deal with this. Uh, so long as we give them a chance. And so that's what we're trying to do at Coral. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a little bit of good news is that the science shows that we don't necessarily need to protect every single reef to have long-term coral persistence, uh, which is good because this would be hard for any organization to accomplish. Uh, instead, we need to protect networks of connected and diverse reefs reefs where there's a high enough level of diversity and where corals are connected to each other through spawning and ocean currents. So there's just a little cartoon of what this would look like in the Mesoamerican reef as an example. If we start by keeping reefs healthy in one area and move to the other and our partners are working in other reefs, then eventually through spawning, genetic traits that lead to greater survival and reproduction will spread and we'll be left with a network of healthy reefs that have adapted to climate change. So we're a small organization and we can't do this work on our own. Uh, the key to doing this is to build alliances and partnerships with other conservation organizations, local governments and communities around the world. And that's a big part of my job as the conservation science director. All right, next slide, please. Up, oh, finished building the network, very good. Um, and unfortunately, as many of us know, it's hard to get into a romantic mood when you're stressed and tired. Uh, I certainly have done it. Maybe you have also done it. Just decided to cancel date night because there's too much else going on in our busy lives and we're feeling too stressed out. Uh, it's similar for corals when there are multiple threats that are leaving them basically so stressed they're struggling just to survive. It's unsurprisingly very hard for them to have the energy to reproduce. It, it can take a lot of energy and work to do that. So next slide, please. Uh, what we try to do at Coral is work a little bit like matchmakers. Uh, we partner with interested local communities on the ground to reduce the threats to reef that you heard about at the very beginning, like poor water quality, overfishing, unsustainable tourism. So if we're successful in these efforts, 
a little bit like we've set the table, turned on the soft music, lit some candles, dimmed the lights, and we can hopefully let corals and evolution take it from there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if only it were that easy, just like Emma, I've got a little whoops butt at the end of my uh, show here. Uh, there is a major caveat. We globally absolutely need to reduce our greenhouse emissions. If our planet continues to warm at the current rate, corals will not be able to keep up and evolve and adapt in time. Uh, we know there are many excellent organizations that are working to address this. Uh, and we encourage you to support them as well as Coral Reef Alliance and also to use your voice and advocate for policies and practices that will help us as a country, if you're in the US or as a planet, wherever you are, uh, meet the ambitious climate change goals that are absolutely necessary. Uh, we can also reduce our own carbon footprint by doing what we can at home uh, to uh, you know, reduce our own consumption, uh, fly less, eat less meat and dairy. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done both locally and very much needed at the policy level. There's to, in order to have hope for coral reefs, uh, because uh, we've conveyed they need all of the help that we can give them. Next slide, please. And speaking of help, I'd like to thank the many people who helped with this project. It was definitely a team effort. And in particular, call out the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for the bulk of the funding that supported this. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you for attending and we very much hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move us to a Q&A. Thank you so much for the questions you all have submitted. Um, and we have one. I'll go ahead and start with you, Dr. Kennedy. How do coral larvae find a coral reef to settle on? That is such a good question. So we're still investigating the mechanisms because they are so small and and like we, like I said, like we're still just understanding some of their, cap their capabilities. Um, but we know that they use light um, and they use things like, gra like gravity as well. And some of the most cutting edge research recently is showing that they might even be using sound as well. So coral reefs are actually pretty noisy places, um, but, but I might be able to answer more about it, but essentially they can drift off pretty far away, like into the ocean. And so how they actually find their way back to the reef and find an appropriate place to settle with their, they're covered in tiny little hairs called cilia, so they can, they can swim a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's like a fascinating area of biology at the moment. Thank you. And here's a question from our last webinar uh, panelist, Abby, I was wondering if corals spawn in warmer water when they are stressed, will the baby corals adapt and be able to survive in the warmer water when they grow? Abby, that's a really good question as well. And another thing that scientists are trying to, and you guys should all be scientists because <laughs> you're asking the questions that we're all asking too. So absolutely. And here at the Australian Institute of Marine Science, we're actually looking at collecting some of those um, the, the corals that are still surviving in uh, those warmer areas and spawning and looking at rearing some of those babies in aquaria and seeing if we can breed tougher corals and certainly there's a lot of research as well going to places like the Arabian Gulf they're very very hot and looking for heat tolerance in some of the larvae as well so yeah that's a definitely an active area of research at the moment for coral scientists. Dr. Fox, can you describe what it was like being in the water during a spawning event? Uh, it was it was amazing. So Emma, I definitely recommend doing it if you can. It was uh, on Heron Island on the Great Barrier Reef uh, in 1989. So it was a long time ago. And uh, I was actually working as a waitress there. And there were some researchers at the research station. There's also a uh, research station and so they were all talking about how they were going to try to see the spawning event and if I had my snorkel gear I could come out with them 
And so you know, we were out snorkeling on the reef and it is just as Emma described, it was this sort of like upside down snowstorm with all these tiny little pink bundles sort of floating up uh, to the surface. And the other thing that I remember that I will never forget is the smell of it. Cause it is very romantic, but it doesn't smell super romantic. It's very sort of like <laughs> salty and fishy and things like that. All of these millions of little, uh, you know, mucusy bundles. So it was, it was amazing. <laughs> mucusy bundles. All right. Um, one more question for you, Helen. Do each type of coral have only one exclusive reproduction method? Or do some reproduce with both fragmentation and other methods as described? So as, as Emma said, corals are amazing. Many of them are quite flexible. And so yes, they can reproduce asexually if they fragment or bud, and they can then also reproduce sexually. I don't think they're both spawners and brooders. That's one or the other. Is that right, Emma? Yeah, but, but many can, repro can, can reproduce by fragmentation or by this process with spawning that we're talking about. Cool. This one's for either one of you. Are coral polyps as amazing as their cousins jellyfish polyps and potentially immortal? Uh, so, many good so many good questions. So yeah, in, a, in a way, yes because they're very closely related to jellyfish. They're all cnidarians, so they've got that, you can see even, they've got that kind of circle, like body shape, and they've got the ring of stinging cells as well, uh, like anemones too. And um, so a whole, an entire coral colony, um, some of them, they've looked at the ages of them and they can live up to 4,000 years. So in a, in a way they're immortal, like as a, as a whole, as all those animals joined together into one being. But I don't know about the individual polyps. I think they would probably just live a few, like a few years and then be replaced by other polyps as they, as they grow. But yeah, in, in a way, and they're definitely amazing. <laughs> well, and that's what builds up the reef, right? Is year upon year, the coral colony getting bigger. And you know, there's certainly some that they estimate to be thousands of years old. Is that right? Wow. Cool. These are great questions. We have another one, and I'll try not to uh, mispronounce the words. Does the planula have algal symbionts? It looks like it in the photo. We have a coral, another coral biologist online. Um, so that's a really, really good spot. Yeah, in the presentation that I showed you, the image of the planula was kind of like a brownie green color, and that indicates um, in a coral that there's lots of tiny little um, microalgae that live under the tissues and that's how, how coral um, photosynthesize. Um, so if you remember, I was talking about brooding corals and spawning corals and the, the brooding corals, the planula, do tend to have um, algae in, inside their, their skin tissues and they'll get them from the adult and that's because they spent time like inside the adult polyp so they'll go out into the ocean already looking quite fat and kind of that brownie green color. And I should really have used a different picture for the spawning coral because they obviously produced in the spawning event. And so the eggs get shot out of the coral and sperm get shot out of the coral and they only mix and fertilize um, at the ocean surface. And so in the spawning species, the planula don't and they just look completely see-through just like a jellyfish. And that's what a coral looks like. That's why it goes white when it, it bleaches because the animal itself is completely see-through. And so they'll only get the algae inside them later on in their life when they eventually settle on the reef and they'll collect, they'll collect algae. So that, yeah, that was a very clever question. <laughs> I'm just going to say they're not completely see-through. Aren't they a little bit pinky or orangey? Like I remember again, when I went back to Heron Island as a uh, to help out on the research station. And there were people who were studying the swimming oh. coral larvae and we had to look for them under microscopes and they were not impossible to see. They had a little bit of color to them. Yeah, and I guess, because in the spawning event, you said it, the colors were quite pinky as well. So I've, ne I've never seen rather than completely white. Yeah, it must be the protein, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Cool. This is one I really want to know. Uh, Helen, why do corals spawn under a full moon? 
So I think, and Emma can back me up. But, uh, so they are still trying to understand all of the different cues. And as Emma said, so what the short answer is, I think they try to make it as easy as possible for as many corals as possible to all spawn at the same time. Because the currents are so swirly around, like if you, they're off even by an hour or so, and some are done and some are later, <laughs> it, it, it will reduce the chances of getting those eggs and sperm together. So my guess is that they're trying to get very clear light and also temperature and timing cues to maximize the chances of getting as synchronized a spawning as possible. And I'm gonna just tell one anecdote that I learned from uh, someone on my PhD committee, and I don't know if it's true or not, but he said there's this closing of the bar syndrome. And so right after the spawning has happened, there are very tight egg and sperm, like basically matching requirements because lots of different species all spawn at the same time. And so you wanna make sure you find the right species so that you can make the right kind of coral larvae. And so there are these matching mechanisms. But as the night wears on, and as your chances of finding the right egg and the right sperm go down, those uh, mechanisms also degrade. And so you can get cross species fertilization, sometimes even cross genera fertilization. And again, this is like the magic of evolution. They're like, well, we'll just try it. Maybe it'll work. <laughs> I don't know if you can confirm or deny Emma, but that was one thing I heard. Yeah. 2 a.m. at the bar. Exactly. Somebody else said, thank you so much. I'm very new to the subject. Does the symbiosis with their algae play a part in the reproduction process? I think not. It is very, it, it plays a part just that they have enough energy. Like it's very important for coral survival to have that symbiosis. But again, Emma, if you know more, please add on. No, I don't, I don't think it's particularly involved, but like Helen said, you know, if you had um, like a bleaching event come through and the corals got stressed and they lost a lot of their algae in that year, they might not end up breeding or they might not produce very much sperm and egg bundles because they, yeah, they'll just be stressed like Helen was saying in her talk. Hmm. Question for both of you. How did you all get started with diving or snorkeling? first and then you Emma since you muted. Um, uh, so I, this is a funny story. I was actually uh, born in Puerto Rico and my parents took me to the local pool so I could swim before I could walk. Uh, but then we moved away when I was three years old but I remember going back when I was 12 and my parents were like, well, we have to snorkel. And I just remember the magic of like floating over the waving sea fans and just, you know, thinking how cool it was at the undersea uh, event. And then I actually learned to dive that um, waitressing on Heron Island. Like I used some of my money that I had earned. And the last week I was there, I, I signed up for the dive course. I had enjoyed snorkeling there, but I figured I was never going to have a better chance to actually learn how to, to scuba dive. And you can see a lot by snorkeling, but it's also really nice to be able to sort of stay down and, and see things uh, closer with diving. So that's how I got started. How about you, Emma? It also sounds like seeing that spawning event like so like so early on must have been really inspirational to you like in marine biology career. My story is pretty much the exact opposite. So I grew up in um, in central London, like I think I only learned to swim when I was about 10 or 11, like I'm not a great swimmer. Um, and I eventually ended up learning to dive um, in a big, in London, there's a big gravel pit just outside of London, which is really cold and dark. And I learned to dive in there, but I was always a bit scared of the ocean. And it's just because I love animals so much. And I loved all the weird ones with like tentacles and stingers and lots of eyes and legs. and um, yeah, well, reefs is the best place in the world if you love weird animals, because there's more weird animals packed for me to square than, than any, anywhere else. But yeah, the diving and the snorkeling was pretty grim, learning in a, in a gravel pit. They sunk some old London taxis to try and make it more exciting, but you couldn't really see past your hand. It's much happier in Australia now. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Upgrade from the gravel pit. 
Um, Dr. Fox, can you talk a little bit more about the interventions used to help colonies grow? Sure. So I, I'm not sure if this question is asking about coral restoration. Uh, that is, there's certainly lots of groups that are looking about, can we uh, put new substrate down to help corals grow on it? Or can we transplant healthy corals to areas that are harder? So there, there are a lot of efforts like that. Uh, at the Coral Reef Alliance, we're focused on what are sort of solutions that can scale more broadly. So a lot of the restoration efforts would be very difficult and very expensive and maybe even impossible to do at the kind of scale that's needed for the current threats that reefs are facing. So we're focusing very much on how can we reduce those threats to basically give nature and evolution the best chance to do that. But there certainly is a lot of focus on uh, trying to uh, basically find the areas where corals have the greatest chance of surviving. Uh, and again, we're trying to, to look at a diversity of those areas. Uh, Emma, I don't know if there's anything you'd want to add to that. Yeah, yeah, I guess just to add to that, I think a lot of people don't realize like, some of these solutions sound so nice, don't they? Or being able to like breed super resilient corals. But I think just here in Australia, the size of the Great Barrier Reef is bigger than a country, it's bigger than the UK. And so to just go out and physically like replant corals just isn't really feasible. And so the kind of solutions that um, the Coral Alliance are looking at are more those kind of like bigger, bigger scale, like things that are thinking about as a planet, how we're still gonna have reefs in the next 50 years. Cool. I'll do a few more. Does the type of reproduction, e.g. asexual reproduction versus sexual reproduction, change with higher temperatures? That's a good question as well. I think higher temperatures will just stress the whole, the whole animal. And so they probably, like it depends on the, the species, but we know some of them like if they're stressed, will grow like more weaker skeletons. So they'll be, they'll still be budding, but they might be doing that more slowly. Their skeletons might be growing more slowly. Um, yeah, and the, the same with the, the effect of the temperature on their ability. It's just like any animal that's stressed out by anything is gonna not be able to invest as much of their energy into any kind of reproduction, whether it's sexual or asexual, I think. Yeah. Right, yeah. like as I, yeah, as we saw in um, with the reproduction, they all also, all the different species have really different strategies. Like they're so complex and a lot of them do really different things. And so they often choose to forfeit different things or behave quite differently, which is why we see some corals bleach and some not. And, some continue to spawn and some get really stressed and not want to spawn at all. I, just, I want to add just to the audience people, there's some great questions that are coming in and getting answered, typed up. So like, you know, if people want to know more about the cell biology involved with heat tolerance, there's a whole paragraph of an answer in that. So I don't, I would just encourage people to scroll through the, uh, the answered questions too. Yeah, there are great questions coming in. This is a, a lively audience. Um, I have one that's actually two questions in one. Does bleaching prevent breeding? And what is it about bleached reef that hinders colonization? So I think the first part got answered by Emma that bleaching basically it stresses the coral. So there's less basically energy that it can put towards reproduction. Uh, and then in terms of if there is a bleached reef. So if reefs stay bleached for a long time, that coral animal will eventually die. Uh, it doesn't, it's not getting the energy from the algal symbionts. And Sometimes if that dead coral, like that can serve as a good place for a new coral larvae to settle and grow. So you can get 
recruitment, it's called, when you have new corals coming and settling and growing on a reef that had been bleached. And indeed, that's how bleached reefs sometimes recover if there are enough healthy corals that were able to spawn and not have a, a recruitment failure, which is what's happened in some of the places of the Great Barrier Reef when it's been bleached so badly. And the other bad thing about uh, a big bleaching event is sometimes instead of being sort of good bare coral, there's, uh, or coral with, it's called calcareous algae, there's instead sort of like slimy filamentous algae over a lot of it. And that surface is very difficult. It's not a good place for new corals to come and grow. Mm. Cool. What happens to eggs if they do not meet a sperm and create a baby coral? They're food for someone else. <laughs> They're gonna get eaten. And that's part of the other reason why spawning events are really exciting to see. Like Helen will tell us probably more about it from her experience, but a lot of the animals start to learn the timing of the spawning and those eggs are really protein rich. The corals have invested a lot of energy in making a lovely, beautiful egg. And so it'll be like a really tasty treat for a fish or other like larger plankton in the water as well. And often animals will gather, like um, especially big plankton eating animals, like mantas and things will gather at the start of the spawning event and get really excited about taking advantage of those eggs that they get fertilized. Great. We'll do one more question. Could genetic diversity in corals be threatened by changes to ocean currents? I think, well, uh, maybe at the very large scale, right? If reefs that were connected become less connected, or if the coral reefs in a certain area have been so stressed that they are not, you know, basically their own diversity has gone way down, so then it doesn't move as much. So uh, I would say yes uh, at a broader scale. Yeah, it's, it's almost the other, the other way around. And so a lot of evolutionary biologists who look at like, coral diversity and why they're so diverse in some areas and less diverse in others, look a lot at ocean currents to understand, you know, how like the, the planula are getting moved around and especially in some really remote islands in the Pacific, how did new corals like end up there and trying to understand changing ocean currents and how that explains like evolution over much longer time periods is like a fascinating area of science. Yeah, and they, some people think that the coral triangle is the most diverse area because it's got sort of Indian Ocean genetic diversity and Indo-West Pacific genetic diversity, you know, mixing together and that's where it meets and similar to what you're saying. So we really are talking about the motion in the ocean. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and leaves here today with love in your hearts. And if you feel like sharing this love, please visit coral.org, make a donation, be on the lookout for our spring appeal, Help us save more coral babies for the future. Don't let those eggs get eaten. We can't do it without you. Thank you. Have a great day.